little touch pass there. Benson waiting, cuts in, he scores! Oh my! Into the middle, holding, back, Toporowski shooting, shot block, got it back, shot, score! And center of pass forward of stop, shot, back to play, score! In front, Groove scores! Jaden Groove scores the triple overtime winner. Welcome into WHL Unfiltered. Uh, pleased to be joined by Craig Button, the TSN's Director of Amateur Scouting and uh, former NHL General Manager. And also uh, joined by my co-host, uh, Sean Mullen. It's, it's, uh, it's a pleasure to have you on the show tonight, Craig. Well, Chad, thank you very much. Uh, you know, I guess my big question for you is, as I saw Sean and uh, PEI, where were you? <laughs> yeah, I mean, out here on the West Coast, it's, you know, a nice place to be a lot of times. But I was, uh, yeah, I was unable to, uh, unable to catch that tournament. Yeah. yeah, just kidding. us. I'm just kidding, Chad. I mean, you keep us all informed of what's going down, what's going on down there in the U.S. Uh, side of the Western Hockey League there and that division out there. So uh, appreciate all your great work. But it was an absolute wonderful time in in Prince Edward Island at the World Under-17 Hockey Challenge. I was there um, broadcasting uh, on the Hockey Canada stream with HN Live, and I know you were doing color for the – the uh, medal games on Saturday, as well as pre-scouting it, just reflecting back on the tournament as a whole and what you got to see, what are some of your first thoughts that come to mind? Well, you know, one of the things, Sean, that that I think is really, really important is just starting to get, you know, what, what I call first impressions of these young players. A lot of them, I, like most of them, I haven't seen. These, this is the first time I'm getting uh, eyeballs on these players. And, you know, I, I don't go into these types of uh, tournaments. Uh, with the idea that I'm that I'm going to do hard evaluations, I, I, I'm using it at, 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 as uh, as this first step to to watch them and then to uh, what, what I like to refer to as as a window into further evaluations. I mean, these players and and you watch them. Six months ago, they were playing U16 hockey for the most part. I mean. And, and and the vast majority of them are. I mean, this is these are big steps for them in their in their hockey careers, moving up levels, playing against players uh, in the in, in the junior leagues that are a lot older than them, and 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 now they're trying to adapt. So you you for me watching where they're at, it, it just serves as okay. How are they adapting? You know, when I go and watch them again, and then and down. Uh, uh, to the end of this year, into uh, uh, you know 2024, into the summer, into next year, as they head into their draft years, you know, it just gives me a really good opportunity to see how they're handling things. And you need a base, you need a start, and 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 this is a, a it's a really good start. And you know, for all these players, it's a best on best international tournament. It, it like like all these young players that have been good players, that, you know, coming up. And now they're going, whoa, that guy's pretty good from Sweden. And whoa, that guy's pretty good from Massachusetts. And and even within Canada, you know, because there wasn't a U-17 camp this summer in Calgary, you know, kids are finding out about how good the players are across Canada by, by not only playing with them, but also playing against them. So it's a real opportunity for these players to to, 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 to see, you know, the competition and, and certainly – you know, we know that they're good players, but that's how I look at the tournament. And uh, I, I, I get excited about going there. I spend a week there watching, and it just gives me a, a really good opportunity to start the process for, for, you know, what I call this cohort of players. Yeah, pretty – always a really, you know, interesting opportunity when, you know, all the guys are the same age or, you know, the vast majority of them or whatever, you know, like we talk about the the Hinlinkas or or that type of a thing to where it's – you know, you you don't have to you don't have to sort everybody out because everybody's on a, a level playing field. It's a it, you don't you just don't get that opportunity very often. 
No, you don't. And and and, and again, they're going to play against each other internationally. And you, you you know you think about the various players, and you you know even 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 in different events that you have, you know how many times are you going to be able to watch Gavin McKenna play against yeah you know uh, good players from Sweden? You, you're going to see it probably in the U, U uh, in, in the U18 perhaps certainly uh, in the in the Holinka Gretzky tournament but you know this is their first step to to see those players and and you get to see them all on the same surface on the same ice surface and you get to see them in an environment where you know they're trying to push their level and and, and it's an eye opener it's an eye opener for me it's an eye opener for the players it's an eye opener for the coaches and and I think that looking at it through that lens I think uh you know, gives you uh, gives you that uh, that perspective of like, be patient. You know, this isn't a hard evaluation, and you, and you don't have to uh, sort them out in a way. Okay, who's the best? Who's I mean, it, it becomes obvious who some of the good players are. It wasn't I mean, Sean, you know, and Chad, I'm sure you were tuned in. You know, it doesn't become it's not very hard to figure out that uh, Gavin McKenna is a pretty good player <laughs> that like you know stands out. But you know, for, for for a lot of the players, it's about you know just seeing how they take those next steps. Well, and one of the things about the event itself that really stood out for me, outside of early in the tournament, where it looked like at the beginning, like the Americans might be so much the class of the event that they could run away with it. And then they came back to earth and everybody else kind of raised their level. But beyond that, how close the competition was between all six teams that, you know, it's not what you necessarily see in all the international events. Any game any night, any day, the result could go in in either direction. All the overtime games, all the comebacks. I mean, it was extraordinary to watch. And really looking back on it, I don't know how you'd have picked a winner. Well, and, and, and you're right. Early on, you can say, oh, boy, these look like the favorites. And, you know, one of the things I was talking to Jeff Bukaboom, I mean, four-time Stanley Cup champion. He's got a pretty good grasp on uh, – on you know winning and you know going through the process and one of the things he said to me after after the Sweden uh, Canada White game where you know Canada White really jumped on him in the semifinal and one six one he said part of that is is really learning you know okay there's round robin play and and he said it's it's like the regular season and then the playoffs start and he said what you have to realize is that there the the level of intensity grows and it becomes more uh, intense and, and harder. And he said, it, 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 everybody's trying to learn that. And I think that uh, regardless of what it is, Marcus Nielsen, whose son Eric played for Sweden, you know, he played in the NHL. He was in a Stanley Cup final in 04 with the uh, Calgary Flames. And and he talked about how, how, how valuable the experience is to see, you know, as the tournament progresses and how – hard the competition becomes and how the intensity ramps up and he goes you know now, now now you get to watch how the players handle it the next time and you know one of the things i've noticed uh sean and chad is is that an in international play you know when, and i see it at the world junior level now you know you look at who's won gold medals in the last 10 years in the last 12 years it, 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 sweden finland canada usa you know russia's not part of it to you know have been part of it for a couple of years. Jackie has made real strides up in, in getting to, uh, to to the medal round and whatnot. And so I, I, I think we're seeing how close the competition is and we're seeing real development of, of teams and, and, and individuals from around the world that are capable of, uh, you know, providing really good, strong play in these international tournaments that give their respective countries a chance to compete for, for the gold medal. You know, you well, get, one of the things you, I, I really noticed, sorry, sorry, Chad, was just speaking to, the, to what you mentioned there about how the tournament changes as it goes along. I thought John Dean, who's the head coach for Sault Ste. Marie, but was the head coach for Canada White, really did a great job. And I spoke to him you know, early in the event and, and later on as the playoffs medal round got started and just kept a very even keel about things, even though Canada White didn't win until their third game. And you know, had some adversity. He just said, "We're getting better every game, and all that matters is that we're at our best when it comes to the medal round." And he set the tone with that very even keel. And really, as it went along, his words came true. They got better 
every game. And so it was really impressive the way that they came together as a team. It really was, wasn't it, uh, Sean? I mean, they were they were big time impressive. I mean, you look at the medal standings. I, I, I you know, at one point in time, and the uh, we were preparing for the uh, uh, for the gold medal match, and you know that was Canada white and USA. And they said, "Well, let's put up the board." I said, "The board doesn't matter anymore where they finish in the standings. <laughs> like, let's stop with the board that shows them in sixth place." You know, it, it's tournament play. You know, they won two games. Yeah, they were in a shootout in overtime, but it doesn't matter. They, you know, they were getting better. One of the things John told me and is that, you know, you're throwing – he said, you know, you come together. A lot of these players didn't have the benefit again back to the program of excellence uh, summer camp in Calgary. He said, so, you know, they're all coming together. We're trying to, you know, implement some – uh, some different systems of team play that we think are really essential for success. And he said, the player, like, we kept giving them things, and, you know, and they kept taking them. He said, but it's great that we give them, and it's great that they take them, but they were applying them. And he said, so that gave us more confidence that they could continue to handle more things as the tournament went on. And he, and he was really impressed with their ability to, to take the information and apply it. And I think that, Sean, I mean, we saw that with, with Canada White and certainly a team. And, and, you know, I say this all the time. It's not where you start. It's how you finish. And the key to tournament play is getting better over the course of the tournament. Canada White certainly did that. Well, where I wanted to go was, you know, Sean mentioned, you know, the Team USA and having a strong tournament, even if they, you know, came up a, uh, short in the in the middle game but you know as as an american i already have a new favorite iserman and i've seen you know a little bit of this this kid play and and uh you know what 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 can you tell us craig I, you have him listed you know very high on your your initial craigslist for the year let you know let's uh maybe delve into some of these these prospects so cole iserman yes please. Oh, okay oh okay so okay no problem i mean I mean, Cole is a, to me, he's an elite goal scorer and, he, and he's a hungry goal scorer. And, and he's a lot like Ovechkin and they just don't, it's not just that they want to score. They want to take the puck and drive it through the net. They live to score. You, you know, I, I know Cole has made a comment. He says, I wake up every day, uh, thinking about scoring. <laughs> you know, it's like he's wired to score. I mean, he's dynamic score. He, he can score in so many different ways and, you, you, you know, you consider what he did as as, as a 16-year-old player last year at the uh, U18 tournament. He went into that tournament. Uh, USA won the gold medal in overtime against Sweden uh, in Switzerland. I mean, he was a really important player for that team. So, you know, his, his game is predicated on power, on skating. And, and, you know, players like him that can score in the manner that he can score, he can score in so many different ways on the rush, off the one-timer, he, he plays in traffic, he attacks into the into the heart of, a, 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 what I call the guts of the action. So when, when, when you look at everything that he's able to do to impact the game in a positive way, that's a unique skill. I think scoring's the hardest thing to do in the National Hockey League, or, or in hockey for that matter. And, and I look at an elite goal scorer that is, is driven to score. Like, he lives to score goals. And he does it exceptionally well. The American model being the way it is, is obviously pretty unique compared to what the other teams and the other countries are doing as they have, you know, their top 16 year olds all together on a team and their top 17 year olds all together on a team. And I know Greg Moore, who coaches the Americans at the tournament said the main advantage it gave them, especially early was on special teams. But just looking at that development model and all those guys playing together at that same age group versus you know, a guy like Gavin McKenna playing on the Medicine Hat Tigers and having to battle top end 19 and 20 year olds for ice time and for space and, you know, produce against them. How do you contrast those models? I mean, certainly the, the team being together all the time is better for the international setting, but in terms of the player development, how do you feel about it? You, you, well, I think you have to go a little bit back in time and, and consider you know, what was the genesis of the program and why it was created. And, you, you know, back in, I mean, the first year, you know, in 1998, it, it, it was it was created because there was so many disparate uh, areas of the U.S. You had Massachusetts, you had Michigan, 
you had uh, Minnesota. So, you know, you had prep schools in Massachusetts, you had club hockey in, in Michigan, and you had the high school system in Minnesota. And, and they were disparate. And, you know, trying to bring those, the, the, those areas together always proved to be a challenge. And so when Ron D. Gregorio and, and Jimmy Johansson, you know, really, you know, started to talk about what they wanted to ultimately accomplish, they wanted to accomplish a sense of, of unity. Uh, of like, okay, we're hockey players, and, and, and yes, we have different areas uh, of the country that, uh, you know, have, have really developed players and developed really good players, developed star players. And so the idea was is that they wanted to develop, they wanted to bring a unity across the country and and ultimately compete internationally at the junior level and at the world championship level leading to the Olympic level. They said that they had found that the kids were coming together and they didn't have a sense of, 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 of pride, maybe pride, maybe I'm being a little bit uh, uh, hard on or harsh on that, that, that they wanted them to feel that like we're wearing the, the stars and stripes and we want to go and represent our country and, and all the way through the process like Canada. They, they were watching Canada, how Canada and everybody said yes to participating for, for their country and they said that we had to start – at a younger age. Now, the benefits were that, yeah, you get to play together all the time. And, you know, certainly that became something that, uh, you know, benefited them. But it also did create that unity. What it also did is as expansion happened in the NHL, you know, other other markets were playing, were, were developing hockey players. So now you see players that were able to come to the program from different what we call non-traditional hockey markets and you you, you you were building this the, the, this kind of unity with the players all the way through us all the way through cycles and and I think it's been I think it's been wildly successful to the point where Canada you know they used to you know the program of excellence bringing players together was an, another idea of saying that we're going to bring a hundred of the best u16 players together we're going to bring players to, to calgary for uh training in the summer with the with, with u18 you know so it it's worked in both ways uh and other countries benefiting from too now the the, the chl program in canada you know prohibits you know canada from having a similar program and you know, the, the other part of this, too, is the USHL has done a tremendous job of really developing their league, great coaches, great league, great leadership. You know, it's really run well. So even when you talk about those 16-year-old kids and the 17-year-old kids, they go into the USHL playing against junior age kids. Think about it. Think about it, Chad and Sean. Think about a team playing in the Western Hockey League that were all 16 years old. And that's what the that's how the program starts, and 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 they get I, I don't want, like you know they get thrown into the deep end big time playing against players that are bigger, stronger, more mature to them. So it starts off with a real challenge for these kids, but the benefits in terms of bringing bringing different parts uh, players together with that idea that they're going to represent uh, Team USA, it, it really has paid off significantly with the idea and the goals. Uh, that that were that were laid out at the outset of the national team development program, and I, I think there's you know there's countries that have picked up little parts of it, you know Canada included, uh, other countries that have done different things, and and now we've got this international model of of, of development and playing that, that that I think is is really positive for the overall development of young players. Pretty interesting, and obviously you know. The U.S. as a whole being a non-traditional market, you know, trying to figure out ways to, you know, get sticks in the kids' hands and, and, and you know, develop. And they've obviously done a good job over the over the years, you know, and regardless of the controversy of, you know, so selection for World Juniors and, you know, aside. But imagine you're always going to have that. But, yeah, it's pretty pretty interesting to see what they've, they've built here in the States. It, it really is. And, 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 and again, when you start to think of, I mean, just think about the Toronto Maple Leafs. They have two kids on their team. I mean, they have, they, they have uh, a past Hart Trophy winner, Rocket Richard winner, and Austin Matthews from Arizona. And Matthew Nyes. Matthew Nyes from Arizona. You know, that's, that's come into the, 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 both of them have come into the NHL. 
you know, from very, a, a, a real non-traditional market. And you start to look at, you know, having good athletes taking up hockey. You know, if you get a good athlete playing hockey, you're going to you're gonna get a good hockey player. And I think we're seeing uh, many, many examples of that. Well, and talking about some of these players, you know, you talked about McKenna off the hop. Everybody kind of knowing Gavin McKenna is a good hockey player. And the, the first two games of the tournament, he and Cole Reshny found instant chemistry. They had four points each in the first two games. And then as the, the turn, tournament got tougher, I mean, they got shut down by Czechia. They got a lot of every team's best checkers, double teamed, et cetera, when they realized how much of Canada Red's offense would go through those guys. How did you feel like McKenna and Reshney handled that? And what was your take on seeing them in this competition? Well, I mean, I, I, I saw Gavin play last season in Medicine Hat, and, you know, it's – it's it's beyond impressive what he does, you know. Uh, Reshney, you know, this was my first time watching him. I, I, I'd heard about him. I, I, I think again, going back to how I go into the tournament, like it's, yeah, I, I know I'm putting eyes on these players and they're playing together for the first time against competition that's pretty significant for the first time. So I'm 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 watching as as they adjust and how they handle the different challenges. And you're right, they come on there and 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 they're really good. They're really productive early on and. Then you, you're watching, okay, how are other teams playing against them? Because all the teams are doing video. All the teams are breaking it down and going, wait a second, we better stop these guys. We better get on these guys. And I think that, you know, I, I, again, it serves as a, it serves as a, what, what I call as a platform for watching, for further evaluation. It's a window in, in, in how you're going to evaluate further. And further means, okay, they were really successful. How did they handle it in game three? How did they handle it in game four? And and and, and you just kind of you're building your dossier on those young players to try to to try to watch how they handle the different challenges that that, that they're confronted with. And some of them are going to handle it better. Some of them are going to handle it better sooner. Some of them are going to take a little bit longer to handle it. And quite frankly, some of them are never going to be able to handle it. That's part of the pyramid of development. So you know, I think that. You know, watching, watching, uh, watching Gavin and and, and Rushney. I mean, they, they they were good players. They were dangerous players. The, the, their productivity in, in terms of stats, you know, obviously wasn't the same later on as it was. But but I thought they generated lots of really good opportunities and lots of different chances. And probably if you ask them, they might say, "Geez, if we could have finished on some of those, it might have been a different outcome." You know, this being a you know, Western League based show. Maybe, maybe we should dig down on some of these high end uh, prospects in the in in, the, in our league. I mean, who are some of the the guys, Craig, that that you are excited to to scout this year? Well, okay, so let me just before I go to that, like you know, like and 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 uh, there's one player that, that that massively impressed me at the U17, and I'd never seen him play. And, you know, my first impression when I'm watching the game, I'm going, okay, yeah, you know, you see the height and you go, okay, well, okay, we'll watch how this kid plays. And obviously you look and you go, okay, he's been a pretty good player as a 16-year-old kid. But and he ended up scoring the golden goal. And Cameron Schmidt, as time went on, I, I stopped seeing him as a, as a five foot seven player and, and then just seeing him as a dynamic, explosive player. I mean, I, I know that I know the twenty twenty five draft is a, is a little ways off, but that young man impressed me massively with his with his skill, with his determination, with his hunger, and you know, you it, it, it's easy when you start off and go, okay, yeah, he's a little bit smaller. As, as the tournament went on, and, and talking about team, uh, Canada White, I, I, I it didn't even. I mean, all I saw was a dynamic player, and when he went in, I mean, he got raw. I mean, he got robbed. Uh, right before he scored the winning goal, and then, uh, uh, well, not right before, but d during that game, and then he, he he went down that ice there in, in overtime, and I, I I said the speed, and he he learned, and to me he was going to score, and he and he certainly did. Now, as we go into this year's draft, <laughs> uh, you know, Chad, just to go back a little bit, you know, I I, I think the player. And, and, and I felt it again, like that he had a, and, and watching Gavin McKenna last year, you know, in Medicine Hat, you know, Caden Lindstrom in, in, in Medicine Hat has, has had a massive, massive, uh, presence, uh, in the game. And, 
He's big. He's strong. And 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 I just see a player that that that, that is just continuously getting better and better and better and better. And you know, when you watch somebody, you know, not only take command of the game and and improve, uh, you're also watching somebody that can impact the game in so many different ways. And you know, you you you, you like having watched him play through the end of last year into like, well, I saw him at the U-17 in, into last year down the stretch at the Holinka Gretzky and now early in this season. I mean, it is, it, it, it is really, really, really impressive uh, to be able to watch him play. And I, I, I think that, it, I, and, and I do believe this, I, I think he may still be just, just scratching the surface of what his capabilities are. Like that's how good he is. And so he, he's one player that really, really stands out for me, really stands out for me in terms of his ability to, to, to impact the game. And, and, and I'll, I'll be straightforward with you. I'm not even so sure that he even knows how good he can be yet. <laughs> like, that's the, that's the fascinating thing. I, I, I think he's still raw in a lot of different areas. Uh, of trying to find his, of trying to find his way, and uh, so, so obviously, you know, that's one player. I, I mean, you can't go past Berkeley Catton in Spokane. Uh, you, you know, there's so many things he does in the game. He was the captain of uh, of Team Canada at the Lincoln Gretzky tournament, and it, it, it's his all around game. And his, his all around game is one predicated on intelligence, on competitiveness. I think that he has all the skills to be a a really good player in the National Hockey League. You know, Mike Richards, who I uh, you know, know a little bit older, he was from the 2003 draft. He won a couple Stanley Cups. But, but, but I think that Berkeley has a style of game a little bit like Mike Richards. You, you know, you're going to appreciate him a lot when he's on your team, and you're going to appreciate him a lot when he's, when he's suiting up for you and uh, he's on your side. I, I don't know how anybody can't be impressed with Tarek uh, per, uh, uh, Parasek from, from Prince. I saw him play at the edge last year and I knew he'd been drafted and he went back to the edge school in Calgary. But I mean, I'm watching him and I'm watching at like a, a, an offensive player that's elite thinking all the things that go with being a really, and, and that Prince George Cougars team is, is has come out of the gate and been a really, really strong team. Uh, you know, there's, you know, I love Ryder Ritchie. I, I, I think Ryder has a, has a lot of capabilities uh, in, in the game. I, I, I think he can score. I think he can make plays. But, but he's, he's a competitor. And he, he does a lot of things in the game that, that, that help you win, like board battles and driving the puck to the net and being hungry on pucks and creating loose puck chances uh, for his teammates. And, and he'll take advantage of those. And, and, and his season has started out tremendously as well. Uh, you know, Carter Yakimchek, who, who watched him last year in Calgary here, you know, you just watch somebody, and he, he just got better and better and better as the course of the season went on. And his confidence in jumping into the attack, those types of defensemen, you know, that's the way the game is played now. And, and the way Carter approaches the game, I think, is really, really uh, essential to having success in the NHL. He's confident jumping into the attack. He can shoot the puck. He can make plays. And he's got a lot of range. And I, 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 I'm going to finish because it, it, it's very interesting to watch T. Jiginla. I mean, over now in Seattle, or excuse me, over now in Kelowna from Seattle, you know, and a lot like his dad, at the same age, and, uh, and I watched Jerome, you know, from the time he was 16 through 17 into his draft year. You, and dra- Tiege, you drafted him. Yeah. yeah, I mean, we had a we had a great group that, uh, you know, I, I don't think it was one of those things where one, I mean, we, we became pretty clear that Jerome was a, was a player that we, uh, that we uh, certainly thought highly of, and, and, and we did draft him. But Tease is, is a lot like his dad in the sense, Jerome at that age, there wasn't a lot of flash to his game. And, you know, but there was a lot of intelligence. There was, there was high level of comp, uh, of competitiveness. He, he, he understood how, how to gain advantages in the game. And, and now you watch and teach, you know, gain that confidence and, and, and the confidence with the puck on his stick and, and scoring goals and making plays. I, I, I think that, you know, he's another player that you're going to have to watch over the course of the year, but I've seen real tremendous 
progress in Tej. And I think that playing in Seattle last year, even though he might not have got as much ice time and I mean it was a great team but every day you're in practice playing against good players I think it really really helps a player and I think it helped teach and you know he's he's in a new spot in Kelowna and and, and I think that uh, you know how we started out this year it, it has been more than impressive so you know if there's any other players you want to ask me about that, 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 that that's fine but you know I think that you know all in all you're you're looking at uh you're looking at some players that, you know, that I've watched that, you know, I, from the Western Hockey League that uh, I think are uh, pretty good prospects and players that <laughs> you're going to see playing in the NHL in the years to come. Well, I, I know with Tej, like the, the first time, and we should clarify the reason I said you drafted him, you were director of scouting for Dallas when yeah. Dallas drafted uh, Jerome. But Tej, I remember first watching him, I think it was at the Rocky Mountain Classic, and he looked like a good player, but he just didn't. You're, you're right. His skill level didn't stand out. And as I've watched him since, it does seem like he's made significant strides that way. I imagine work ethic uh, throughout the off season and season probably plays a big part in that too, based on where he's coming from. I don't think there's any question. I mean, I mean, he, he he's competitive, and and he comes from a competitive family. So I think that when you put all those things together, I think that. You know, you, you build on those things. And, and, and also, being in Seattle, you, you have to compete every day in practice. I, I, I think that those are positive things uh, for for everything for everything that, that that affects, in a positive manner, a player's development. And I think we're seeing that with Tish. Much like it helped Jerome being in, in Kamloops. I mean, that team was a good team. It was a, and, and so Jerome had to compete. Uh, you know, for for every second of ice time and for his spot on the team and for his spot in different uh, situations on the team. And, and when you're on a good team like that, I think it's really, really, really positive for development. Well, yeah, if you can play on a line with Darcy Tucker and Shane Doan. I mean, <laughs> but, yeah, those those are you, – you mentioned some, some really nice players. I In the next two weeks, I get to see Catton – uh, Ryder Ritchie and uh, and and the the kid from Prince George all coming up, so I'm I'm pretty excited about the the next the next schedule, a little bit of schedule here coming through Portland, and we do get a lot of uh, Portland listeners. Have you have you seen much of Diego Budazoni or the or the goalie uh, uh, Spoonar? I, I haven't seen much of Spoonar, but Budazoni, like I mean, I'm, I I know I'm going to butcher the name. I'm excited about seeing him. Like he he he's been really good. He's shown a lot of capability early on in, in, in this season. And that's you want to see progress, right? And I think one of the huge things, Chad, is early on, when you watch these players, whether it be you, be patient with them. You know, they're, when they've been identified early on as, as players capable of representing their countries in international play, when they've been good draft picks, when, they, when they're putting up numbers, when they're playing regular minutes, and, and you, you got to be patient with them. And, you know, maybe they don't show you as much early on. You just talked about Tej, but that's why you got to watch. you got to watch over time. So I, I, I don't think there's any question – uh, you, you know that Portland does a great job developing players, and at, 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 as you go through it, you better be paying attention to players there because they are going to get better. You know they're going to get better with Mike Johnston running the program there because that's what players do in Portland. I, I know you have to run to do some more work because you never stop. But I wanted to get a quick word from you. I saw you on TSN talking about uh, Chris Knobloch taking over in. Edmonton as the head coach in a difficult situation. We saw him win a championship in Cranbrook with the Kootenai Ice. He was obviously great in Erie. You know, watching him at that level, uh, what do you think about his opportunity, his chances of being a successful NHL head coach? Well, I think he'll be a successful head coach. Listen, I think that Chris should have been uh, under consideration for a head coaching job for, for a number of years now. I think that, uh, you know, his his, his his resume, his abilities, his record have all all been tremendous and you know you you, you look at what he's done in, in terms of in, 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 in Kootenai with the ice you know in, in, in Erie in, in, in the New York Rangers as an assistant or the Philadelphia as an assistant Rangers farm team I, I just think he's got everything you want in, in, in a head coach and I think that he was most deserving of an opportunity long before this one arose 
and I think that he'll do a terrific job. One of the things about Chris that I love about him is that he, he is he's a leader and he, he he's a sharp guy. But he, you, you, I, I've said this many times: no smart person has ever had to tell me how smart they are. You realize how smart and intelligent they are, and that's how I feel about Chris. And I think the players are going to find that out real soon in Edmonton. Yeah, I was in the building that night. He won the won the Western League Championship in, for for the the ice. It's a it was a I, I, had, a, I had a different recollection of it than he does probably. But uh, anyway. I was in the building that night too. Yeah, uh, Chad, I was in the I was in the building that night too, and I remember phoning Jeff Chanel with. For a ticket, I said, can you put aside a ticket? Oh, well, there's lots of tickets available <laughs> because, you know, you think about a Western Hockey League final, it wasn't even sold out. It's hard to believe. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, so, yeah, like like Sean said, I know you, you have to run. you have any other uh, cl- uh, final thoughts you want to uh, put a bow on this there, Craig? No, I, you know, the, the bow I'm going to put on it, and, and, and Chad, you do a terrific job of keeping people informed about what's going on in the Western Hockey League. And I, I said it on the broadcast, Sean, you've been very kind, but, you know, the, the parents, fans of, of teams, you know, the, the, the ability that they have now to go on to, to broadcast on the Internet and then through streaming, which is a big part of uh, broadcast. I mean, it, it's so significant. And, you know, what you did with NA, HN Live, you know, for Hockey Canada. I mean, you're bringing, you're bringing, uh, you know, not only a great competition, but you're you're bringing exposure to the young players, not just for their families and their friends, but also to the people in the hockey world that are looking to evaluate them. And you know, all I can say to both of you is, is, is keep up the fantastic work because it's valuable work and it's important work, and you 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 two both represent that in a huge way. Well, thanks so much, Craig. I, I really appreciate that. It was great running into you, and uh, we appreciate the kind words. We appreciate the time. I know you've got another radio hit to do here, but uh, thank you so much, and we hope to talk to you again soon. Yeah, for sure. Anytime, you guys. Thanks. Yeah.